Thank you very much, Professor Ruggie. We want to turn over to you now for questions and comments. Uh, before we do so, uh, first I'd like, I think on behalf of all of you, to thank Professor Ruggie for his presentation. I think many international figures um, either recycle their old speeches or delegate the speech writing to others. Um, some low-level people, like myself, recycle their old speeches. Um, but in this case, Professor Ruggi, I think, wrote this from scratch and really tried to look not only at, not tried to explain not only what he's done, but, but why he's done it. So thank you, John. Um, the Q&A, let me explain a few things. Number one, you know there's not much space in your seating rows, and we're going to ask people who want to ask questions four at a time to come down to this microphone. We need to do that for the video camera to be fixed on this microphone. Um, and we want to do this four at a time, and then John will, will answer after the qu four questions are asked. We'll, we'll carry on until um, 7.30 or so, so there's a good, good half hour. Um, but, but you'll have to be cooperative in letting people out who want to get to the microphone. So can we ask the first, can we ask four people to, to make their way here? Anybody who would like to ask a question or make a comment, if you can start making your way. Number two, please keep questions and comments um, brief and focused so that we can let as many people as possible speak. Number three, please state your name and affiliation before you ask your question or make your comment. Um, and number four, as I mentioned, we're video recording this event, so please um, speak clearly into the microphone. Um, I'm Morris Mendelssohn, um, I'm the Queen's Council at Blackstone Chambers. And um, I was very much involved in this topic from the time that the draft norms were published. And I first of all want to congratulate Professor Ruggi on a really tremendous job in steering his way through this minefield and producing a very valuable document. Um, I do have a number of suggestions which I'll raise at a later stage, but there's one particular point that I wanted to raise, and it's this. On the one hand, um, Professor Ruggie, I think rightly, um, tried to avoid um, too much legalism at this stage. It pains me to say this as a lawyer, but I think he was right. Nevertheless, um, we've got to know what human rights norms are. And in this document, it refers to the rights which are contained in, the, uh, in particular in the two UN covenants and the uh, seven ILO conventions. However, some of these norms are, for example, programmatic. Many of the norms in the uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Convention are programmatic. Now, how um, does a company who wants to do the right thing, who wants to respect, quote, human rights, know what the rights are um, in this uh, particular context and, and bearing in mind that there are some of the home states may not be parties to some of these norms, some of the ILO norms for example, that could also be a problem. Um, and um, so I think that one can't entirely avoid legal considerations even though I appreciate that this is simply a framework and a first step. Thank you. Francois Beaujolin, I am uh, the president of the uh, Human Rights at Work Foundation. So uh, if I understood uh, you love uh, norms and standards, uh, s but you also said that uh, self-assessment was an important thing, and you spoke at the end about ISO 26000. Can you tell us a little more about what should be assessment on these problems and if there is a need of uh, a framework on assessment? Otherwise, the things companies will do would not be true. My name is uh, Hugh Williamson. I'm a journalist with the Financial Times. Um, I have a simple question. Um, assuming you're uh, uh, um, given or 
in the case that your, your proposals are endorsed by the Human Rights Council, can you give me examples of two or three or four specific examples of the way you think corporate behavior will change? What will, particularly multinationals, what will they actually do to, in, in their day-to-day -day activities that will be different um, once your proposals have been endorsed by the Human Rights Council? Thanks. Robert McCorkett, our Director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Let me start with your point about porridge. When we look at porridge, we also have to ask whose bowl is it in? And therefore, I'm not sure the idea of porridge is necessarily the right notion in terms of it's just right, if in fact the bowl has been created by only one group. And that particularly in human rights, of course, uh, the whole notion of human rights is that human rights are a presumption which you are in favour of, for which there's limited exceptions rather than the other way around of getting a balance. The second question is in relation to where you would see the future direction, the person taking on from you, if you like. That where do you see this going? Where would you like uh, development? In particular, to pick up something Morris said, where would you like in terms of law? You've, you are understandably cynical about uh, international law and its principles. Others of us are perhaps not so cynical. And that uh, is it not possible, in the same way there have been developments in the application of international law beyond states in areas such as, if you like, indirectly through the Doha Declaration on Trips, through international economic law, you've already talked about uh, bilateral investment treaties, in relation to international humanitarian law. They all deal outside the state system to some extent. Is it not possible to be inventive, to move the debate forward in international law in a way that actually applies your principles effectively so corporations have at least at an underpinning level a legal obligation, not purely a social expectation? And that's so, that is necessary because in many instances that is the only flaw, the only possibility that victims of corporate abuse have, relying on corporate good nature, particularly if the corporation are dealing with matters of non-industrialised world consumer goods, have a very limited desire in many instances to uh, protect uh, those to whom they are um, having a consequence of their actions in terms of human rights abuse. Thank you. Well, th <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for those questions, um, Mar Maurice. Um, thank you um, uh, for um, um, your um, early involvement. Where are you? Over there, um, uh, and and helping us um, uh, early on with uh, with with clarifying a number of, of difficult issues that we were grappling with. Appreciate your help. Um, the corporate responsibility to respect is independent of state duties. It is an expected standard of conduct that um, is required for a company to achieve and sustain its social license to operate. It isn't a legal requirement. Legal requirements are imposed by states, and states have and will continue to impose legal requirements. The corporate responsibility to respect, as we have defined it, exists over and above legal requirements. Therefore, what a home state has ratified is irrelevant to the question of the corporate responsibility to respect. If you're a Canadian company, I grew up in Canada, so I keep referring back to Canada. If, you, if, if, if you're a Canadian company operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo, whether the Canadian government has ratified a particular convention is irrelevant to the expected standard of conduct of that company in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is expected to respect rights there no matter what. So um, the, the issue that, 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 that you raise in, in, within our framework is a non-issue. Um, and it's a non-issue precisely because the corporate responsibility to respect is not derived from state legal obligations. It exists over and above or separate from state legal um, obligations. The, the second question had to do with um, um, I, uh, the, the, the issue of uh, sort of self, um, uh, I don't know what the, I can't remember the, the, the word that you used, self-monitoring uh, or self-assessment. Um, the, the, the whole concept of human rights due diligence um, w with which we have put out there and which has been road tested now 
by a group of Dutch companies to see what it actually looks like in practice. The whole concept underpinning human rights due diligence is to know and show. A company has to know and show that it respects human rights in order to be able to say that it respects human rights. Showing is not self-assessment. Knowing may be self-assessment, but it would be unwise to rely only on self-assessment in order to know. It would be much wiser to involve communities and external stakeholders who are impacted by what you do. But showing, by definition, is not self-assessment because others judge what you say and, 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 and compare it uh, with your activities. So the, the, the entire concept of human rights due diligence uh, rests on, on and, and I, can I be academic again? It's not a monological process, it's a dialogical process. It literally involves the company and external stakeholders. Um, and therefore, um, it, it, it goes well beyond um, uh, self-assessment. Um, um, how will, uh, Hugh, how will the behavior of companies uh, change? There are a lot of companies in the room and I, who, who have struggled with the issues and have tried to adapt the notions of the framework to their own corporate practices. I'd love to hear from them to see um, what their experience um, has been. Um, we know um, uh, from the pilot projects that we're running that the companies that have set up community-based grievance mechanisms are behaving very differently than they did before, uh, because they now, um, uh, if we take the, the example of, of Sakhalin Energy, which is a, not the most obvious candidate for this kind of a project. Um, they um, have set up um, a, a, a system that records every grievance that comes in, assigns a corporate manager to follow the grievance, requires them to report um, openly within a certain period of time. Uh, if the grievance is not resolved, they have to explain why it, can't, why it hasn't been dealt with uh, within that specific period of time. And that information is public information. That's pretty different. Um, companies haven't traditionally done that in, in, in the past. Um, going forward, um, I mentioned earlier export credit agencies. Um, they're beginning to require companies to do due diligence. They want to know how, if, if, if I'm a government, I'm in, investing in, in, in an, um, or, or support, uh, supporting an investment abroad, um, the um, export credit agencies increasingly want to know from the company, how are you going to manage the risk of contributing to human rights harm? What are your plans? Show us your plans. Um, that attracts attention um, because the export credit or the investment insurance or whatever the vehicle is, is desired by companies. It helps them. Um, the OECD guidelines update the, uh, is, is uh, potentially significant because the OECD has, a, the uh, guidelines have attached to it a national complaints mechanism, the national contact points. Now that there is a, there will be, I suspect, I expect, a human rights chapter in the OECD guidelines, complaints can be brought to all 40 adhering governments about the behavior of companies. And the companies um, um, will be um, asked to respond. So there is no, and I, I've said this from the outset, there is no single silver bullet that we can fire to solve this. It's a multi-dimensional problem and it has to be approached in a multi-dimensional um, manner. And, and, and what we, what's important is to make sure that those things all somehow cohere and reinforce one another. And that's what we've tried to do by providing um, the guidance that we have. Uh, finally, Robert, with regards to um, your comment about international law, I'm not cynical about international law. I'm, I'm just a realist. Um, um, I, I, my expectations of, of international law um, as a political scientist, you, you, you would guess, are, are not exaggerated. Um, I don't expect international law to be able to deliver everything that we need delivered uh, in this space. Uh, but as I said in my remarks, um, it certainly will and has and will continue to make an important contribution 
but uh, as I said, as precision instruments, not as uh, an, 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 an attempt to shove an entire emerging issue area into a single binding instrument um, as the norms tried to do. That's just, that's just unworkable and isn't going to happen um, in any of our life, lifetimes. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Miles Lipinoff, the coordinator of the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility. I'd like to ask you, Professor Ruggi, to what extent you think that the financial crisis demonstrates a failure of our banks to respect human rights? Thank you. Um, Patricia Feeney from Rights and Accountability and Development. Nice to see so many faces. Uh, <laughs> they might have. Um, Professor Ruggi, we're really getting into the end game. There's a lot of food for thought in the draft guiding principles. But as an NGO that's worked throughout your mandate, actually, um, trying to get access to a remedy, I find them rather disappointing. Um, I don't think, I don't have any confidence for a serious remedy from company-based grievance mechanisms. Um, convince me. So Peter Webster from IRIS, Corporate Responsibility Research Outfit. Um, my question is, how important is it for the principle of respecting rights to extend to investors in companies as well as to the companies themselves? And taking up your sort of connectivity idea, what, what are the responsibilities or rather the expectations on investors to avoid infringements in their portfolios and to address impact, human rights impacts where they do occur in the companies in, in which they invest? still writing. Um, financial crisis, um, I think long before we get to the issue of human rights, the financial crisis is an example of privatizing gain and socializing risk and cost. And it's a failure of government. Uh, it's a failure of company and corporate governance. Um, long before we get to the issue of human rights. Of course it had horrendous human rights impacts, but we don't, we, we don't even need to go there. Um, the, the, the fundamentals of governance and corporate governance failed. Um, and gain, as I say, gains were privatized and risk and cost were socialized. Um, Tricia has no confidence in um, company level grievance mechanisms. If, if um, company level grievance, or uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, operational level grievance mechanisms were, were, the, were the only um, element of um, our proposed solutions, um, I, I, I suspect um, that, the, that you would have a right to be disappointed uh, because um, it only applies in, it doesn't apply to all, to all companies in all circumstances to begin with, um, but it's part of a much larger package of um, recommendations that we have made. In the sectors where companies do have a large physical or social footprint, um, and companies um, and, and the companies uh, uh, take um, um, their responsibility seriously, it is an, an enormously useful tool. Um, as I said earlier, it is first of all a feedback mechanism. It, it is a monitoring system. You get direct feedback from the people on whom you have an impact. You incorporate that into your activities um, as, as, as you um, uh, conduct your business operations. And it, it, ser it serves as an, uh, as an early um, um, uh, stage um, grievance mechanism so that the community organizer in Peru doesn't have to create a big problem in order to attract the attention of a company. I... I the, 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 among the studies that, that we have done is, is, is one that looked at um, um, uh, corporate related human, uh, alleged human rights abuses. We examined, um, I think it was something like 400 um, that, took, that, that were 
made public over a, a two-year period. And I, I was frankly stunned by uh, the number of them that began as lesser grievances that escalated, that weren't dealt with um, at an early stage, and then became major crises. Now, if I, if, if I care about victims of human rights abuse, I want those things stopped early. And if I make a 10% difference, that's 10% more than I had yesterday. If I make a 20% difference, that's even better. That's double the expectation that I had yesterday. So if I have a victims-oriented perspective about dealing with human rights abuses, I want to stop them all and I want to stop as many as I can and not sit around and complain that you haven't solved all the problems all at once. I categorically reject that attitude, enough said. With regard to investors, I think institutional investors, um, patient capital as it's sometimes described, whether it's pension funds or whatever, are much more likely to, um, um, to be um, engaged and to contribute and should contribute because they have enough of um, um, a, a, a stake in company operations um, and they have typically a long enough time horizon to take these issues very seriously. The, the random investor who owns a share or two in a company, I wouldn't have very high expectations of what their role is going to be um, in this um, uh, space going forward. But institutional investors are critical players. The socially responsible investment um, community are critical players uh, in this. We had a meeting with them here in London this morning. Um, pension funds generally, government pension funds, um, the um, uh, public sector pension funds, um, those are key players uh, that we need to engage um, much more um, in, this, um, in this process. Okay, let us have at least one more round of questioners. And um, there are a lot of companies here in the audience. We haven't heard from any of them. If you have any questions or comments, please, please do come to the microphone now. So we have one, two. We need a couple more, a couple more people to come forward. One more. Coming down from the back, great. Okay, please. I'm Aidan McQuaid, I'm Director of Anti-Slavery International. Um, there's one of the things I was just reflecting on as you were speaking, which is if you look at a lot of the literature uh, in relation to human rights abuses, there's a recurrent theme in them, whether you're talking about paramilitary groups or armies or companies, which is that it wasn't my fault. The individuals within those organizations will generally reify their organization and put the blame upon them. And whenever we're talking about decisions made in relation to human rights, we're really not talking about corporations doing this or governments doing this or NGOs doing this, but individuals within those institutions undertaking and establishing the policies and practices which are going to advance or retard human rights. So is it worthwhile thinking within a broad set of principles, the, the framework of which I thought was very comprehensive, it was more specific in terms of what are the individual responsibilities of business executives, government ministers and civil servants and NGOs, uh, NGO professionals in relation to the implementation and achievement of these. My name's Halina Ward, and I work with the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development here in London. Um, I've got two related questions, really, thinking about the implications of your process, Professor Ruggi, for wider developments in global governance. I'm really struck this evening by just how impressive the process has been and how far-reaching potentially and I'm moved to think about other processes out there and I've got two questions so one is is this process a kind of a, a, a sui generis beastie with no wider implications or if it does have wider implications what are they and very specifically I'm currently working on democracy and climate change links and I wonder what you would say if 
in private, you had an opportunity to talk to everybody involved in the intergovernmental panel on climate change. What, what tips would you share with them? Or would you feel you had nothing to offer because that's completely different? I don't have problems enough already. <laughs> My second question is, is quite a quick one. It's actually also related. Was it right in the ISO 26000 process, which involved hundreds of people, thousands ultimately, if you take account all the national processes, many, many governments, experts from a wide range of stakeholder groups, was it right that the human rights part of that standard was based in or grounded in what was emerging from your process? And assuming the answer yes, why was it right that that process drew very heavily on your own process? Hi, my name's Nikki Black. I work for De Beers, but I've worked in business and human rights for a few years as a scholar and a um, consultant. I have a quick question, well, two quick questions. One, um, the least transparent part of your mandate has been around the role and respective responsibilities of companies and governments in areas of conflict. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about how um, you carried out that part of your mandate, how you came to focus on it, uh, the reasons behind, and I can imagine what they would be, the lack of um, uh, open engagement and transparency, or, or not necessarily open, but more discreet um, closed-door engagement on that. And if you could give us any more insights than what's publicly available about what came out of that work stream and how you see it moving forward. My second um, small question uh, is around where you think sticking points might be when it comes to state-owned enterprises. Given that you've been very clear about the respective responsibilities of states and companies, um, there can be quite interesting vehicles that are created and how do you see that the tensions in that playing out and what um, institutional structures might need to be created domestically and internationally to try and tease some of those challenges out. Thank you. Um, my name is Christian Leithley. I'm a lawyer at Herbert Smith here in London. I'd like to ask a, a quick question in relation to the investment arbitration context which you raised and in particular your point on connectivity. The, um, your, your reference to the Argentine decisions and where our investment arbitral tribunals are referencing human rights, I think is an aspiration for many international lawyers that there's that connectivity. But I think it's still the minority. And we see in decisions even in the last few days, uh, very reputable arbitrators who come from certain fields relying on those areas of law for their, for their reasoning. And so my question is, what is your hope or aspiration or even expectation as a result of your work as to how arbitrators in this field of investment arbitration, where there's a significant overlap with human rights issues, in terms of how they perhaps become better educated in the field of human rights and implement human rights in a, in a cross-fertilization way, for want of a better phrase? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the first question, it's very interesting. Um, I, the, the extent to which um, individuals should be addressed um, in the framework. It's an, it's an, it's an interesting um, notion. Um, I confess that we haven't addressed it um, or thought about it um, systematically. But there is, of course, um, um, a greater, far greater um, legal coverage of um, human rights abuses committed by individuals than there is of, by companies, uh, which is why we've paid attention to companies more than individuals. Um, individuals um, 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 are subject to not only to national law, but um, directly to uh, international law um, for either committing or being uh, in com uh, uh, complicity uh, in um, egregious uh, human rights abuses. Um, whether it's um, through the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court or through um, any of the criminal tribunals. Um, so there, there, there is greater um, 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 coverage, if you will, uh, legal uh, uh, coverage. Um, in the case of, of companies, um, the, the, the legal field is still quite, quite fluid um, and requires greater clarification, um, which is why, as I say, we've, we've focused um, um, heavily on it. Um, 
with regard to Helena Ward's uh, question, is this process sui generis? Um, I, 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 I'll write a book about that someday. Um, at, at the moment, I don't know how to answer it. Um, I, I've certainly drawn on um, you know, a lifetime of research and practice uh, in this area, and so I've learned from lots of other uh, experiences um, how, how much what we have done is replicable in other areas. I really, I really can't say, um, we, beyond certain things like I tried to outline here, the importance um, of um, having um, a, a credible and, and, and evidence-based and consensus-driven process. That, I think, is certainly translatable into, into other uh, issue areas, but uh, beyond that, I really have to think about it more, more uh, systematically. Um, was it right for ISO 26000 to uh, essentially draw on the framework to uh, add the human rights chapter. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm glad they did. Uh, why did they do it? Because it was, the, um, um, it was a comprehensive framework that had been endorsed by the Human Rights Council and was the only thing of its kind that an, a human rights body in the United Nations had ever endorsed. So that's why they did it. Whether that's right or not, um, I'll leave to some higher authority to decide, but I'm glad that, that, they, that they did. Um, with regard to the, the um, conflict part, or the, the role of companies in conflict zones, um, or the role of governments in, 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 in regulating companies in conflict zones, um, we actually did several different projects. Um, we had several uh, public uh, multi-stakeholder consultations on that, including uh, one um, early on um, in, in Berlin uh, that we did together with Global Witness. Um, but we also had a private um, off-the-record um, process uh, involving 15 or 16 governments um, meeting um, in retreats um, um, to um, discuss um, on a, on a scenario-based um, uh, discussion, uh, what kinds of tools they wish they had available when confronted with certain situations in the scenarios. Um, there wasn't any way that we were going to get uh, governments to talk about this seriously uh, in public. Um, if these had been public meetings, they would have repeated their public positions and we wouldn't have learned anything from it. As it was, there was, a, a, we had three of these sessions. There was a terrific um, um, uh, learning. Um, we got good ideas, Com the countries got good ideas from one another. Uh, the Foreign Office here in the UK has put out a toolkit for UK missions overseas on um, how to advise companies with regard to uh, human rights issues, particularly um, in conflict zones. That was circulated within the group, and I think that had um, a, 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 a good effect on the discussions, and I think um, other countries are um, looking into replicating that kind of um, uh, provision of, 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 of advice to missions um, in country where um, um, conflict takes place. So um, we had both open and we had closed consultations and the reason, as I said, for the closed consultations is that it was the only way to have a worthwhile discussion. Um, otherwise, it would have been a waste of time. Um, with regard to state-owned um, enterprises, um, I've made the case um, and have been challenged by, by some in the advocacy communities that, in fact, um, governments have a, uh, a greater obligation when it comes to state-owned enterprises because their own international legal obligations are implicated uh, potentially uh, in what the state-owned enterprises do. Uh, and therefore, um, um, the, the uh, requirement on state-owned enterprises, if anything, should be higher than it is on the private sector. I think they should all be high. But there is a, there is a more direct legal argument to make with regard to state-owned enterprises than with regard to the, 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 the private sector. Finally, with regard to the bilateral investment treaties and the uh, investment um, um, arbitration uh, tribunals, um, I think what you say is, is right. Um, it's an area that, in my judgment, needs a lot of work. Um, I think um, 
when it comes to public interest considerations in particular, the investment tribunal um, uh, um, community um, uh, needs to look seriously at, um, uh, um, at, at some of the issues. Um, depending on the rules um, um, that are used, um, uh, whether it's um, the UNCITRAL rules or, or, or some other, um, people in countries that get sued may not even know of the existence of the suit um, because of the rules that the contracts are based on. I think that's outrageous, absolutely outrageous, when you have a country sued by a private investor that, this, that there are confidentiality requirements that even prohibit knowledge of the suit itself, let alone the content, just the existence of the suit. I think it's absolutely outrageous and needs to be changed, but that's my next career. <laughs> um, I need to make a few quick closing announcements, but before I do, um, can you please join me in thanking John Ruggie for his remarks. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all those who asked questions this evening because it's, uh, I think it was an exceptionally high, high level of questioning. Um, my first announcement is, as I said, this entire event has been recorded on video and within a week or two on the homepage of our site, you'll have a link to, to, to that video. Uh, announcement two, the post-event reception will begin in a few minutes in the room called The Vaults and The Vaults are in the basement of this building. You exit by this door over here, take the stairs all the way to the bottom, and we'll be serving wine, coffee, tea, soft drinks, and some light snacks. Um, you'll be able to stay for a bit, yes? Great. If there's wine, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number three, if you, your organization, your company, should uh, be writing anything relevant to business and human rights or you're aware of it and you think we should consider posting it on our site, just please send it to us. And finally, thank you very much for coming this evening, for your comments. Uh, Professor Ruggie, I appreciate you all being here and we do as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>